Hello students and welcome to the today's class. Today we are going to discuss a very important topic in the economic sphere of ancient Greek society. This is related with the trading activities in ancient Greece and in this today's lecture I will be focusing on the maritime trade which was prevalent in ancient Greek society. There are certain objectives of today's lecture to trace the beginnings of maritime commerce in ancient Greece, to understand how and why most of the port cities and colonies flourished, to understand the categories of merchants in ancient Greece along with the various regulations imposed by authorities on the different trading communities. The abundant and the wide variety of Greek wares, both ceramic and metal, found in modern excavations on many shores of the Mediterranean and Black Seas are a remarkable testimony to the economic expansion of ancient Greek society. These objects were necessarily transported by sea and by the close of our period it is evident that the Aegean homeland was connected with a great net of trading posts, colonies and friendly native ports in the Mediterranean world. Since the pre-Hellenic historical period, first in the realm of Minoan and then during the Mycenaean civilization, the Ionian and Achaean tribes of Greece occupied a prominent position in world trade and navigation. This predominant position of Greek navigation gave rise to their exclusive sovereignty over the whole Mediterranean at the beginning of the classic Hellenic era and immediately after the end of the Persian Wars. The overall development of maritime trade followed the peak of Hellenic civilization. This trade supplied the Grecian states with the provisions and raw materials required to manufacture many precious things which were then exchanged for other merchandise. On the other hand, it is imperative to point out that the Greek state's economic condition at that time depended on the import of large quantities of cereals and meat from foreign countries. The most important Grecian states, that is Athens, had to provide for a host of people concentrated within the towns of Athens and had insufficient land to satisfy its needs. Thus, maritime trade was the foundation of the economic structure of the Greek states. If the sea lines had been closed, they would have fallen instantly. The history of the Grecian maritime law began in this period, owing to the importance that maritime trade had for the needs of the different states. Although this may not be the case, no evidence to the contrary has been passed down to us. Our knowledge of Greek maritime laws is so meager that we cannot provide any information that can be considered absolute. However, the mere fact that foreigners were accorded the same rights as natives in an Athenian lawsuit is proof of a high standard of civilization and an indication of the practice of equity from an international point of view. Up to this period, the maritime states of the Mediterranean observed a uniform custom of Grecian naval law due to their exclusive Grecian origin. However, Athens lost her leading position to Corinth. Rhodes was followed later by Alexandria, where most of the world's sea trade was concentrated at the time of the Roman Empire's approach. By tradition, Greece is a maritime nation, as shipping is the oldest kind of occupation among the Greeks and a vital component of ancient Greek economic activity. Ancient Greek's economy was primarily defined by its dependency on foreign items. Due to the poor condition of the soil in Greece, the trade in agricultural products was of particular importance. As Greece's population swelled, the need for additional food increased, obviously. In Greece, it was difficult to cultivate grain due to the country's steep 
terrain and variable rainfall and not enough was produced to meet the need of the population. The impact of Greeks' inadequate crop production was largely mitigated by the country's privileged geographical location. Its position in the Mediterranean afforded her provinces control over some of Egypt's most vital seaports and even trade routes, as well as the opportunity to expand into bigger markets. The Greeks' coastline also facilitated maritime trade activities. The Greeks also engaged in direct commercial competition with the Phoenicians, who had previously dominated Mediterranean marine trade. Before the end of the Archaic period, the Greeks had colonized some of the most valuable trading regions in the Mediterranean. In ancient Greece, colonization had a significant role in trade. As increasingly powerful cities expand, it is inevitable that they will establish trading posts in their colonies. In addition, climatic differences between cities and their associated colonies provided competitive advantage in the production of goods. For instance, Sicilian colonies frequently enjoyed better weather and had access to markets where they could sell grain to towns with larger populations. Larger city states typically exported higher value items such as olive oil to these colonies. As a result of this concern, all primarily commercial governments were encouraged to pursue colonial endeavors and maritime trade. The push of a lack of local arable land and the pull of easy access to the sea both had an impact on the development of these governments. Massilia, a major Greek colony, flourished in part because of its advantageous position at the Rhone River's Mediterranean estuary. Thus, it could have access to marine trade markets and resources in northern Gaul. In addition to exploiting these interior markets, the Greek commercial presence made Massilia a formidable economic entity. According to some scholars, the Greeks of Massilia served as intermediaries in the movement of products between Northwest Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean. Pomeroyads, that great landowners gained the most since they were able to produce substantial surpluses for the market and subsidize the costs and losses of long sea trips. Although the landed nobility benefited much from trade, only few engaged in it because they deemed it beneath their social position. Now coming to the categories of traders, Greek trade was primarily carried out by two different classes of traders. One was Emperoi and second was Nocleroi. The Nocleroi were a group of professionals who made most of their money by owning merchant ships. While as in the case of Emperoi, they used to engage in direct trade. The Emperoi derived a substantial portion of their income from interstate trade. These two flexible categories appear to be used for maritime traders in general. The other two characteristics also help us define the two types of marine traders more explicitly. Free or unfree men who go to sea, whether for a season or longer, mainly on behalf of a wealthy landowner for whom they purchase commodities through international trade. Free men who set sail for a short period or for an extended period in search of goods that they will ultimately resell for their own profit. From 800 up to around 625 BCE, Greek aristocrats were likely responsible for a sizable amount of the products traded by sea, sailing in their long ships with other nobles and even sometimes with their dependents. In ancient times, it was more typical for peasants or landowners to transport surplus products to the neighborhood market for sale. When local marketplaces were unavailable, they chose the sea, but only when those markets were inconveniently situated. This demonstrates that unlike aristocrats, for whom commerce is merely one of a variety of occupations, independent maritime traders and agency traders alike go to sea mostly, if not entirely in order 
to trade. In this segment now, we will be talking about some trade regulations. The traders known as emperor were the primary participants in Greek trade. The government imposed a tax on their shipment at Piraeus, an important port of Athens. This tax was initially placed at 1% or more. The tax was increased to 33 talents by the end of the 5th century. In 413, Athens stopped collecting tribute from the D-Line League and levied a 5% tax on all of her empire's ports in an effort to increase money. These taxes were never intended to be protectionist but rather to generate revenue for the public budget. The expansion of trade in Greece resulted in the evolution of financial practices. Most merchants borrowed money to finance all or a portion of their voyages without sufficient liquid assets. Maritime loans allowed merchants to pay for their shipments. A typical loan for a big enterprise in Athens around the 4th century BC consisted of a substantial sum of money, usually less than 2000 drachmas, issued for a brief duration. The length of the voyage was a matter of several weeks or even months. To compensate the lender for this risk, interest rates might vary from 12.5% to 30% and the ship was commonly used as collateral. Contrary to loans between friends, the terms of the contract were always spelt out in writing. The cargo would be unloaded at the port after the voyage was complete and the wholesaler would then auction off all or a portion of the cargo to nearby retailers, millers or other customers. The ancient Greek government did not regulate commerce. Grain was a prominent exception to the minimal role of the state in trade. Fearful of the large risks taken by grain fleets, private capital was limited and consequently profit hungry. The transportation infrastructures were limited and unreliable and food supply in times of crisis became a matter of national concern. Foreign grain markets must have been maintained by reciprocity treaties and distant grain producing regions were linked to Greece by coastline colonies. Following the inaugural meeting of the new Prytaneans in Athens, trade restrictions were revised with a specialist committee regulating wheat, flour and bread commerce. Wheat trading, for example, was regulated and acquired by a specialist group of people known as grain merchants since wheat was crucial for feeding Athens' vast population and especially lucrative during droughts. Though tax was levied on the movement of products, still efforts were taken to preserve trade. For instance, Athens imposed a levy on its people who had taken out loans on grain cargo that could not be transported at Piraeus and on merchants who had failed to offload a portion of their cargo. Special maritime courts were formed to entice traders to pick Athens as their trading partner and private banks were even institutionalized to ease currency conversion and protect deposits. Similar trading incentives existed in Thessos, a major commercial hub and a major exporter of premium wine. With the end of the Greek states in the late classical period, international trade shifted elsewhere, yet many Greek cities remained key trading hubs during the Hellenistic and Roman periods, including Athens, Delos and even Rhodes. Let us now move towards another topic and it is uh, the articles of maritime traders. The items transported by seafaring merchants were vital to the Greek polis. Some main commodities of trade are discussed as under. Number first, we'll be talking about the grain trade. Athens was more dependent on foreign grain than any other Greek state. Due to the less fertility of their own fields, even the Attic farmers relied on it to some extent. Therefore, the literature of Athens provides a substantial amount of historical data on the extent and control of the grain trade and demonstrates what presumably occurred in other Greek states with similar geographical disadvantage but which failed to leave such an extensive record. At some point, 
most emperoi and nucleoroi participated in the grain trade and emperoi were typically considered to be grain merchants. The grain trade employed a huge number of marine merchants and as the demand for grain intensified, these merchants became important. Bottom tree loans financed no other transaction except for the grain trade. Grain was shipped to the port of Piraeus from the Pontic coast, mainly through Crimea, Eastern Thrace, Syria, Egypt, Libya, Sicily, and possibly the island of Cyprus. Unquestionably, Cyrenaica, which had excellent grazing pasture and sufficient rainfall on the Barker Plateau for winter crops, was the source of the wheat grown in Libya. However, the country probably only produced a marginal amount of wheat for export in exceptional years due to the semi-arid environment and fluctuating precipitation. The same may be said of Cyprus. Under the reign of Andocides, most likely during the Peloponnesian War, when wheat prices were high, this island typically produced just enough for local use and sent grain ships to Athens. Traders from Rhodes, Miletus, Phoenicia, Egypt and Athens brought wheat from that country to the port of Piraeus. It is possible that Rhodes and Miletus brought more wheat from Nocratis on the Nile than they needed and then sold the extra amount to their sister state, Athens. The Egyptian king sent 40,000 medimini of wheat to Athens in 445 BC as a gift to be distributed among the populace during a time of famine. There was a clear Athens reliance on Egyptian wheat also. By regulating the price and destination of Egyptian wheat, exports following the Macedonian conquest of the Nile Valley, Cleomenes, the Egyptian ruler, placed great hardship on Athens and other Greek states. He sent the grain to the most lucrative market while imposing high export duties even though other Greek countries were the first to trade on those far-off beaches, the Pontus, Izunis, northern coastlands, were the main wheat supply for Attica. Timber trade. The central and southern Greek polis lacked adequate wood resources throughout the classical era. Thus, they were compelled to import it from abroad for temple embellishments, housing, furniture, fuel, and wooden walls essential to military strength. The demand for ship timber grew much more in the 4th century. Like grain, the timber had to be imported by commercial ships from a great distance. The primary supply of such wood was Macedonia, where a royal monopoly on timber existed. For every Greek polis aspiring to be a naval power, massive imports of ship wood were required. Other cities, besides Athens, negotiated with Macedonian authorities for timber. Now, talking about the slave trade. The slaves may have been seized by other non-Greeks forcibly before being traded into the Greek realm. Slavery existed in the Greek economy and civilization from the beginning. Greeks would mostly rely on long-distance external slave trade exchanges because they offered more consistent and substantial supply than internal warfare. After 600 BC, non-Greeks from the Danubian Basin, the Black Sea region and Asia Minor made up the majority of slaves in Greece. The logistics and time required for such lengthy transfers required men whose primary occupation was the trade in slaves and the high and ongoing demand for slaves in the Greek political systems ensured that such dealers would always have work. Perhaps most of the locations on the Greek world's periphery functioned as main locations from where the slave traffickers came from. During the ancient times, Phoenicians, the leading slave traders of the Levant, were also active in Greece. Another group was of Panionios of Chios. Both supplies and slaves were generated during military campaigns. Therefore, some of the traders who accompanied a ship or army were likely involved in both types of trade. Now talking about the pottery, the Atlantic coast of Africa has yielded examples of the fine Greek pottery that was in high demand overseas. 
Greek pottery and other valuable items have been found far from their original locations. These discoveries indicate that trade occurred between Egypt, Asia Minor, Spain, North Africa, etc. Other notable exports included wine, particularly from Aegean islands such as Mende, olives and olive oil which was transported in amphorae like wine, marble from Athens and Naxos and dreadle, a type of ship waterproofing material from Kois. Now let us talk about the official attitude towards the maritime traders. According to historical sociologists, except in trade ports, anyone who worked professionally in any form of commerce was positioned much lower on the social scale in agrarian cultures. In terms of the social standing of maritime traders, However, possibly such a rhetoric of otherness is premature. When we say that a person has a certain social status in Athens, we imply that he elicits particular types of assessments in Athenians' thoughts. But can he be claimed to have a social position if he largely goes unnoticed other than the essential food he brings? Individual Athenians' concerns about social standing were superseded by the city's reliance on imported food, the distinction between Athens and other pre-modern agrarian communities is made by this essential aspect of the traders' place. Not only were the majority of emperoi and nucleoroi traders from outside of Athens, but they were also non-residents. Most of them financed their trading with bottomry loans due to Athens' prosperity and influence profit margins, non-resident maritime traders are drawn to the city. For instance, a trader who arrived in Pontos in the 4th century was granted duty exemption and priority of shipping only because he was bringing grain back to Athens. Emperoi was subject to Attic legislation which required them to bring two-thirds of the grain they imported into the city of Athens. These officials had positions known as overseas of the import market, which likely involved further oversight or maritime traders. Most Greek trade rules prioritize securing imports, a practice that some scholars have criticized as economic imperialism. Like Athens, other polis also routinely levied taxes on imports and exports and designated special personnel to monitor activities in respective ports. Greek politicians controlled their wealth. Sparta designated individuals to handle the disposition of the booty, which was auctioned in the open market with the proceeds going to the polis. The disposal of loot, particularly the sale of prisoners of war, was also strictly regulated by Athens. Now let us talk about the merchant partnerships, which is referred to as the commenda in the literature of ancient Greece. In ancient Athens, maritime trade was mostly in the hands of small business people who collaborated with partners to arrange shipments and conduct trade. Athens was a significant importer of grain and there are detailed accounts of how partnerships were created to import cargoes to the city. Typically, trade was undertaken with borrowed funds and required the cooperation of three to four parties, including a merchant shipper, a ship owner, an investor and a wholesaler. Each of these individuals performed a unique function or provided unique skills to the project. The investor provided finance, for example, the ship owner provided transportation, the merchant purchased, sold and transported the cargo and the wholesaler sold the cargo upon its arrival at the home port. The merchant shipper was the enterprise's leading figure, typically operating on credit. He arranged a deal with a wealthy investor to cover the cost of the goods and freight charges. The merchant would charter or contract space abroad, a vessel for a certain travel destination with a ship owner. The loan for the voyage would be secured by a promise against the sale of the future cargo. In the unlikely event that the merchant was also a ship owner, the loan would be guaranteed by a pledge against the vessel. Otherwise, the merchant would accompany the ship for the duration of the voyage, arranging purchases and sales 
as necessary. If the ship was lost in a shipwreck, assaulted by pirates or captured by enemies, the investor's investment would be lost and the merchant and ship's captain would be at the risk of dying. Due to the significant risk, the interest rates on the loans ranged from 22.5 to 30 percent over a period of four to five months depending on the voyage's duration. At the conclusion of the voyage, the ship would arrive at the port Piraeus if the eventual destination was Athens where the cargo would be unloaded and the wholesaler would auction off the cargo to local stores, millers or other consumers. Once the cargo was sold, the merchant was able to repay the loan, customers and port taxes and any remaining freight charges. Commonly known as a commander partnership, the arrangement between a merchant, ship owner and the investor was the most typical form of collaboration which was ever heard in the literary traditions of ancient Greece. It was a contract in which the parties contributed diverse skills and abilities to commercial endeavor. One merchant invested capital, another provided expertise and labor, the third partner invested transportation means and so on. It was a feasible method for financing business in a low capital economy and avoiding wage labor. The commander was an arrangement utilized by investors to distribute risk over a number of modest economic projects. Although it is sometimes cited as a medieval institution, however, its origins are stuck in ancient times. Frederick Prior attributes the earliest instance of this type of commercial organization to ancient Babylon. And he also mentions that the Athenian maritime partnerships and Roman sea loan arrangements as early instances. So this is all what we have to study in today's lecture. I hope you have enjoyed this session. Thank you so much.